Thank you, Professor Asante, for that wonderful and warm introduction. And thank you all for gathering beneath our vast Alberta sky and opening yourself to a discussion on how we belong and how we can enlarge the space of belonging for others. I begin by offering you a passage from my latest novel, The Selector of Souls. It's a letter written, written in the mid-90s by Ranu, a Punjabi Hindu woman, to her cousin, Sister Anu. Sister Anu is a nun working in Shimla, India, and Ranu has adopted Anu's daughter, Chetna. Ranu's husband's name is Jatin. It's a little bit abridged, not much. Sister Anu dips her head to the crucifix over the door before entering the clinic. She unpacks the medicines and locks them in the steel cupboard in the nurse's station and only then allows herself a few minutes to read Rano's letter. Yesterday, a trainee asked, I see the A drive and the C drive. Where is the B? I explained there used to be a B drive when computers had two floppy drives and no hard drives. No hard drives, he said, amazed. I felt ancient just because I remember a time before hard drives. Have you felt old yet, Anu? At work, praise has come my way, but I was passed over for promotion today. I'm too good at what I do, and management wants me to keep doing it. Mr. Zhu from Hong Kong was promoted instead. He could tell I was upset, especially since I do exactly the same work. We started the same day, but I know his starting salary was about 10,000 more. Over dim sum, he explained, male programmers won't take di direction from a woman. Didn't I see that? I didn't. I said, most computers used to be women. Women computed for corporations and universities and calculated for the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos. Now we try to be like computers and give them Turing tests to see if they can pass for women. He said, did I know it has only been about 50 years since Canadian judges declared women are people? What's 50 years? In his opinion, it may take 50 more before men don't mind being managed by women. Men, he said, are just naturally domineering. There will come a time, he said, but this is not it. When will it be time? I asked. I don't know, he said, but until then, women must endure. Then he pointed out that both of us may have been members of a majority in the old country, but are now minorities in Canada. Minorities should not create disharmony, he said in pleading tones. Mr. Zhu, I said, if I wanted to be treated like this, I could have stayed in India. <laughs> Yet India is the song that's always playing at the back of my mind. In this vast land, I miss India's millions of unnecessary people, miss the dust, the hubbub, even diesel fumes. Jatin stands on guard for Canada, oh Canada, but then he was about Chetna's age when he came here. Still, the India, I imagine, is no longer there, just as you are no longer in Delhi. I haven't seen you in Shimla, so I can't imagine you there. There's always some elsewhere, a place where I am not. Like the past and future, it is not necessarily better. I am not in all the places on earth that I could be at this moment, I'm here, me. But in my head, I'm back in Delhi with you, yet you are no longer there. When I read Pop's letters, I can't believe the same man who carried us on his shoulders and taught us to drive can make such snarky remarks about people who aren't Hindus. 
Have I become so Canadian and multicultural, or is his attitude just part of aging? Multiculturalism must be successful indeed if Rano now finds her father's prejudices remarkable. Sister Anu folds the letter, lifts it to her nose. Canada smells like this. As someone who straddles boundaries and categories and works in solitude, I have trouble being a joiner, a belonger, a follower. An Indian journalist once described me as a rootless cosmopolitan. And it's true. I have sung the Canadian expat's anthem, uh, Canadien Errant, in India and now in the USA. So what can I know about belonging? Everything I've learned about belonging was learned from not being Indian enough or not being Canadian enough. Yet when I represent Canada in international competitions, I feel very Canadian. Canada is the only country that can't deport or exclude me because I was born here. My parents arrived in Canada one snowy February 5th in 1962. My father had a master's in business from UW-Madison and experience working at two uh, multinational companies. If he'd emigrated to the US, he wouldn't have been permitted to own land had he the money to buy some and couldn't have known U.S. law on this matter would change in 1965. When my father applied for jobs in Montreal, he was told he could have one if he would take off his turban and cut his hair. The second half of this story is about a Jewish man, Len Gelfand. Uncle Len, as I called him, in typical Punjabi fashion. It took Uncle Len two years to persuade Canadian, Canadian National Railways to hire my father, turban and all. Len was a World War II veteran who understood the dangers of exclusion, the importance of refusing exclusion, of demanding to belong, and demanding that others belong as well. At this conference, we're commemorating the story of the Komagata Maru. A hundred years ago, our nation brought about injustice out of a sense of wounded entitlement, wreaked violence in our name toward fellow citizens who had done us no harm. We called those fellow citizens undesirables. There have been larger and more popular exclusions and expulsions by state authorities before and since, from the witchcraft trials to the relocation of the Acadians, from the Japanese-Canadian internments to the Holocaust, from the partition of India to the state-sponsored anti-Sikh pogroms of 1984, on and on. Yet the Komagatamaru incident haunts us as an expression of a multidimensional racism that rose all the way to the prime ministers of the times. It represents exclusion from the empire, along with the denial of the right of return to the passenger's land of origin. All this at a moment when technology began to shorten distances and allow underdogs to challenge unjust laws. We're in a similar transition today, with the Prime Minister Stephen Harper calling for exclusionary laws when the Sun Sea docked in 2010, bringing nearly 500 Sri Lankan refugees to Canada, with Bush sending captured people to Guantanamo offshore, as in 1914, where habeas corpus can be suspended. Both leaders leapt from the words refugee or prisoner to terrorist without hesitation. Today, with the number of refugees in the world exceeding 43 million, racism comes dressed in suits or dresses and finds a welcome on TV panels it can argue logically in newspaper columns and on talk shows. Racism is not only practiced by people of European heritage, it can murmur piously in gurdwaras, churches, mosques, and temples. It powers clever comments below CNN, Vancouver Post, and National Post articles. It can be polylingual with its righteousness. Everywhere, it preys on economic fears and stokes fears of miscegenation. It urges purification of bloodline, gender, and background, and offers hatred and violence as solutions. The emotions it forbids are welcoming, love, tenderness, comfort, nurturing, all the emotions we associate with home and belonging. 
Here's a Cherokee story. A grandfather tells his grandson there are two wolves within him, one with a hunger to destroy and the other with a hunger for love. Grandpa, says the little boy, which wolf will win? The one you feed, son, the one you feed. I love this story. First of all, because it skips a generation, making me wish the grandfather had been wise enough to tell this tale to his son. And second, because it feels true of myself, true of my circle. Why are there two wolves in the story? Why not a wolf and a lamb? I think it's because love has its dangers too, for it can make us obsessive, exclusive, or overprotective. Abraham Maslow said that we have a basic need to belong. Often we hear people who join the armed forces, enter a seminary, or sign up for UN services say, I responded to a call. I responded to a wish to give my life meaning and serve something beyond myself. But then people who volunteer for suicide missions with Al-Qaeda say the same. We are leaves in sunshine, light on one side, dark on the other. So we must carefully examine the privileges and benefits from the groups and castes we are born into and those we join voluntarily. It's when we consider our privileges deserved, a birthright, God-given, lifelong, or natural that we begin to demand social and legal exclusion, even violent exclusion. The Ku Klux Klan, the Asiatic Exclusion League on this continent, the Nazis here and in Europe, the RSS on the Indian subcontinent, patriots who nuclearized India in the 1990s, fundamentalists and fascist groups have much in common besides misogyny. Their members can rise up and betray neighbors, even kill them for personal gain and status within their group. The edges of our community are ever, communities are ever uncertain. People join, people fall away, those uncertain edges shouldn't concern us, but the core values should. Those core values penetrate us as children till we form our personal moral code. Do our group's values feed the wolf that hungers for destruction or the wolf that hungers for love? In most communities, rules are set by a previous generation. We usually know the rules, but it takes years to decode why the rules exist. For six, the rules are documented in the Rahit Meriada of 1954. Already they're antiquated, with their assumption of unmarried women as transferable property and an outdated list of forbidden Hindu rituals. But we need more than subscribing to a set of rules to feel a sense of belonging. On August 5, 2012, a white supremacist shot and killed six people at my Gurdwara in Oak Creek, Wisconsin. Six from Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, Stockton, New Orleans, Oregon, all over the, or North America soon arrived, four and five to a car, on buses, trains, and planes. What drew them? The need to help, to be enlarged by seva, service to the community. Together, we cleaned blood off the walls and floors, patched the strafed doors, tore up blood-stained carpets, recarpeted, and strung more speaker wire so the overflow of worshippers in the basement could hear Kirtan. We were all amazed by the number of non-Sikhs who showed up for candlelight vigils and stayed for the public funerals. We weren't drawn together by blood, race, or threat, or the rules of the Rahayat Mariada, but by a shared sense of outrage. The shooter had violated more than our friend's bodies, had defiled more than his faith or ours. He had turned the US flag into an idol and attacked the principle of live and let live. At a community healing session a few weeks later, my husband David and I heard Arno, an ex-neo-Nazi, who had abandoned hate groups, speak of his experience and his renunciation of his old ways. Afterwards, I asked, which was the moment that changed him? Arno said it was the birth of his little girl. 
He could not imagine introducing her to his world, to his friends, exposing her to the hate-filled songs he was writing and singing, or teaching her to fire a gun. Birth is the beginning of a new story, the revelation of our relationship to the creative force, no matter what we believe about its origins. It is tempting to conclude that until men can reproduce, only girls and women can make such moments possible. Yet we know women, too, who behave exclusionary and tribal when their status and self-interest are at stake, like Malkiet Kaur Sidhu, a mother who ordered her daughter, Jaswinder Kaur Sidhu, killed for marrying below her caste, Nothing at the time could have untwisted the logic that led to her valuing of her own social status, her position, her perceived dharma above her daughter's human right to own her own body, her daughter's right to love, her daughter's right to live. The counter-argument is that she was only doing her dharma, her duty. But to translate dharma as duty misses the whole performance act, uh, aspect the acting of a role. It is when we translate dharma as role that we can understand, though not condone, what drives a parent to disown a child. Remember your first day in high school or college? Maybe you thought, what will they think of me? Why should they accept me? How do I find a welcome? Have you ever surprised yourself by what you were willing to do to belong? As the Milgram experiments showed in the 1970s and the scandal at Abu Ghraib verified, normal people can consent to torture if ordered, if they deem their role requires. So in any group, we need courage to be nonconformist, to offer dissenting opinions. At all times, we owe it to ourselves to follow a personal moral code based on compassion rather than role. Just as to the Vancouverites of the time, the Komagatamaru was a ship of strangers, the newcomer to any group represents both danger and connection to the rest of humanity. To welcome and share, in French partager, is to take the position that each of us are offered a part. We make a choice. We can think of our family or race as a boundary where our influence and community ends or a place where a world of abundance begins. Neuroscience now tells us that language shapes how we think, not the other way around. Early feminists knew this instinctively when they demanded gender-neutral words be added to the English language. This work is only just beginning in gendered languages. For instance, in Punjabi and Hindi, the word for someone is koi, a word that's masculine. In French, the feminine word for someone, quelqu'un, is rare and poetic. Language shapes how we think on the national level, too. We use words like undesirable, unassimilable, wetback, FOB, to exclude long before immigration officials begin enforcement. Even in normal conversation, let's ask who's being included and who excluded when we hear the pronouns we, they, them, and us. Rituals can exclude and self-exclude. For instance, early Christians began to eat pork on Easter so Romans would not confuse them with Jews. Six sit together and eat after worship and the inclusive ritual of langar breaks caste at every meal. That also differentiates us from Hindus. In Indian tradition, a woman's parents politely refused to take even a drop of water in a married daughter's home, so they could not be accused of claiming a single rupee from her new family, a taboo that now contributes to the devaluation of daughters and promotes the horrid practice of sex selection. All of us share one magic word that has the power to enlarge and renew us. Are you ready for it? It's that little connecting word, and. To meditate on the word and is to open yourself to the world, to see the path of history within a tradition and its future, 
To meditate on the word and moves us to see destabilizing opposites that are simultaneously true. To meditate on the word and is to enrich our lives and move from con contradiction and fixity to human pathos and relationships. This little word reopens us to others, to strangeness, to dreaming. Newcomers of all origins modify their traditions as they assimilate, but we also gradually change what Samuel Huntington calls the core Anglo-Protestant culture. For instance, a tradition that benefits the mainstream by example is hospitality, just as the hospitality we've been shown at Mount Royal during this conference. It is more difficult to exclude people with whom we've broken bread or roti. Buckminster Fuller's geodesic dome opened in Montreal in 1967, a visual symbol of the power of synergetics from connections for man and his world. I was watching Captain Kirk going in search of aliens on Star Trek, while my father's white turban and Uncle Len's crew cut head leaned over our kitchen table drawing up two lists. One for me to carry in my Red River coat pocket, names of friends I should contact if my parents were ever deported, and another of items that should be in our runaway bag in the closet beside the front door to our apartment. It wasn't until I was researching World War II and the Holocaust in preparation for writing The Tiger Claw that this scene came back to me. From the history of his people, Uncle Len could tell us what our runaway suitcase should hold. In 1968, after my brother was born, my parents returned to India. They wanted him to wear a turban and believed India would be more welcoming than Canada. After the state-sponsored anti-Sikh pogroms of 1984, my brother removed his turban and cut his hair. He said he didn't want to be lumped with other surdies. He wanted to be himself. As for me, I learned that a welcome can change to exclusion in an instant. That all it takes is permission and inaction from an authority. All it takes to do violence after that is relaxing your personal moral code. Sadar Sarup Singh, my grandfather, the partition survivor, put it this way. The second person you rob, set blaze to, wound or kill will be easier than the first. You will have crossed a line inside you. Uncle Len visited us in India. The socialist in him was irked by the caste system and the value Indians place on birth and genetics. He and my father kept in touch till 1985 when they split on the issue of my marriage. My father could not figure out why Len would encourage me to defy him and go astray. And Len could not figure out why my father thought he had the right to decide what his daughter could do with her body and her life. They could agree on religious rights, but the gender rights issue was so divisive they didn't speak for years. In microcosm, they foreshadowed foreign policy issues today. Here's a character from one of my stories in progress. Maybe you have an auntie just like her. She can marry whomsoever she likes. All I said was no juts. They're jealous types. What do you mean by African Americans? Oh, blacks? Oh, well, no blacks. They're also dark and into drugs. Uh, Jews? They have good sense and make money, but no, oh, they look so very different. We don't want our grandchildren to look different. Muslims? Ha! Don't even talk about them. How can you even? Ha! You're such a Muslim lover, aren't you? Suggesting such a thing for our nice, sweet daughter. Your cousin, I might remind you. Hey, and no Brahmin boys, okay? You have all these Brahmin friends. We know that. Don't you go introducing her to snooty Brahmin boys. They don't treat their women very well. White men? Which white men? Le you know white men, darling, especially Protestants. They just divorce a woman at the drop of a hat. Then what will your poor cousin do? So you see, marrying out can be defined as marrying just about anyone. 
It's silly to restrict our choices in this way, but we've been so concerned about the uncertain edges of our groups, we've given ourselves a fear of miscegenation. Maybe President Barack Hussein Obama is so fearsome to many conservatives because he's living proof of consensual love across the color barrier. We need to take a stand in our families against shunning and social death in our communities. The idea that anyone should pay for loving a man or woman of a different race, religion, or of the same sex should now be history. The wolf who hungers for love in me, says love is precious wherever we find it. At the Komagata Maru Memorial, near Canada Place in Vancouver, a sliver of shock ran through me to see the names Sarup Singh and Kishan Singh on the wall. These were the names of my two grandfathers. I wished I knew the stories of the other Sarup Singh and Kishan Singh whose names grazed my fingertips. I also saw Hindu and Muslim passenger names, Bansai Lal, Razim Ali, Khan Muhammad. Their names caution against telling this story as if it happened to six only. It happened to every participant. For instance, I'm impressed by the Irish attorney, J. Edward Byrd, who worked for the human rights of his fellow citizens and against an unapologetic, pervasive, white Canada-only culture that had come to seem natural. Edward Byrd seems to me a man who followed a higher humanist moral code rather than his self-interest or his race. Several years later, Martin Luther King wrote in his letter from Birmingham jail, an unjust law is a code that a numerical or power majority group compels a minority group to obey but does not make binding upon itself. There were no restrictions, for instance, on Canadians going to India. This is difference made legal, says Martin Luther King. Today we might extend his argument. If a rule or law targets another community or family member, disproportionately it's unjust. And it's up to us to participate in local, national, and international politics to prevent injustices for ourselves and for others. In Shiva's Tandav Nritya, the dance of creation and destruction, Shiva dances with one foot holding down Apsamara, the demon of ignorance. To keep our groups moving in the direction of creation and away from destruction, we must be willing to restrain our ignorance, willing to say, I don't know. Maybe that's what Nanak meant by naming his followers Sikhs. The word implies being a lifelong seeker, open to eating from the tree of knowledge, no matter the insights that that brings. And when Sikhs wish each other, Chardikala, we're wishing for progress through physical and intellectual arts and the art of dreaming a better world into existence. It takes far more energy to unite than to partition. Robert Baldwin, no relation, and La Fontaine knew this when they united English and French Canada in 1843 and pushed for responsible government. It is significant that La Fontaine refused to join the Executive Council unless Baldwin was also included. It takes far more energy to create a better world than to destroy one. Pierre Trudeau knew this when he pushed for multiculturalism. We, whom Parizeau famously called les ethniques in 1995 after the referendum, understand that if Quebec were to separate from Canada, it would probably be the end of multiculturalism. Hope lies in widening the mainstream in every situation. I like the idea, whose lineage I trace to Guru Gobind Singh, that if we want inclusion for ourselves, we must fight for belonging for all. But as I said, I'm not very good at belonging, but I do believe we are all created different to help teach one another how to love. I'm better when I belong to many groups, even if most of my time is spent on the periphery. Becoming as hyphenated as possible is great fun. So if you're a Hindu, I suggest attending a mosque a few times. If you're a Sikh, try worshiping the creative spirit as a Parsi or a Muslim sometime. 
Not to worry, as Indo-Canadians say, our God is their God too. If you're an atheist, try art, music, magical realism, Sufism or Buddhism, they may crack you open to transcendence where the abstract concept of a creator cannot. If you're a Christian or a Muslim, I invite you to join us in the Gurdwara for Langar. Take your seat cross-legged on a carpet with other learners. You may be knee-to-knee -knee between average humans or privileged people. Either way, our dal will be ladled from the same bucket and will break caste as we break roti. When we join multiple groups, we learn to love Canadians as well as Canada, to love fellow Sikhs, not only Sikhism, to love Muslims as well as Islam, to love Indians, not only India, to love the young Punjabi woman who has disagreed with her family and needs shelter, not only the image of the good, good, sweet, sweet Punjabi woman. As Nanak said, Tol taram deya kaput, responsibilities arise from compassion. Traditionally, men of all cultures are taught to feel shame of weakness and to think compassion, caring, and nurturing come in boxes marked women only. Mothers are complicit when they send the message that crying is for girls or that lashing out is an antidote to frustration or that a bride's consent is assumed from the moment a marriage is arranged. It takes courage and moral clarity to go against group thinking and discuss responsibilities to women and girls, responsibilities that rise from compassion. When I learned Uncle Len was dying, I called my father. And in light of the fact that my non sake husband and I had by that time been married 26 years, asked him to call Len. Maybe it took growing older. Maybe my father had learned the Rahayat Mariada, the Sikh code of conduct, is outdated. Or maybe it takes a bridge person. My father called Uncle Len and the two made their peace. In my experience, bridge people are often women. My theory is that most women experience belonging to more than one family. Many of us know the experience of being split within and then having a piece of their very flesh walk around outside their bodies and survive them. When we belong to multiple families and communities, we know from our deepest selves that ours are not the only customs and ways, and so we can be less threatened by differences. Minority groups know what it's like to be on the outside, as the Bee Gees song goes. Our challenge is to bring more people to the inside. For that, we can begin by treasuring our bridges, our outliers, our dual citizens, our bilinguals and trilinguals, our traveling singers, musicians, dancers, and artists who open us to different ways of seeing. When we celebrate the doubters and the pesky questioners, small network theory says that in time of danger, in time of need, they will be the ones to whom we can turn. The people on the lists my father and uncle Len made for me back in 1967 we're bridge people with weaker links to their own communities. In one of my novels, What the Body Remembers, an old woman remarks that stories are not told for the telling, they are told for the teaching. She says this because in an oral tradition, learning is passed on by rote or by story. Religions began as stories, ways of passing on ideas about the unseen and the afterlife. Stories require a storyteller. The storyteller dreams, imagines, and names the protagonists, frames the narrative, and translates from reality to a story. In my latest novel, The Selector of Souls, the goddess Anamika, whose name means the nameless one, names the gods. Someone had to do it, and since that someone is anonymous, she must have been a woman. Stories don't have to be true to be powerful. The oldest usually include a language of shared symbols. So for instance, most Christians today don't believe that Christ was born of a virgin, but they know that it's symbolic language for his being special and different. We can't prove that the story of Guru Nanak's dead body vanishing beneath the sheet and leaving rose petals uh, is true or untrue, but the magical aspect of it is symbolic language to tell us he was that special. Listening and reading stories is subversive, particularly when women tell or read stories 
because events and stories mostly happen to individuals, and each person is affected differently in a story. So telling a story teaches me how special one person is, traces how like or unlike she is to the groups to which she belongs. Down the ages, stories have been reality's twin, the first virtual reality games. So, do our stories encourage the wolf of fear and destruction or the wolf of love? If we tell both stories, the half about exclusion and the tales of newcomers made welcome and helped in adjustment and belonging, we can feed the wolf of love as well. The generation of the Komagata Maru lives on in ours as shadows and jewels within. When we tell their story today, we may not value all they held dear, but we hope to emulate their courage and carry on their refusal to be excluded. As the double entendre in The Wizard of Oz goes, there's no place like home. We make one where we can, from our web of relations and relationships, reaching out to the weakest links in other networks. I hope you will believe with me that we can offer enough to the wolf within who hungers for love, that we can balance the respect we owe ourselves with the, group, with the respect for, to the groups to which we belong, that we can work for political representation to balance our rights within our families, groups, and our nation. Thank you for every time you think the magic word and, for every time you hear or read a story, for every time you share your own experiences. And thank you for listening to mine. Questions and comments? Certainly.